One of my major frustrations in life is the fact that I'm not an expert sword fighter. Even though I've read about sword fighting online and I kind of know how it works, I've never gotten much practice at it. And I have to admit that if I were, say, walking to the grocery store or something and someone attacked me with a sword, I would probably be in big trouble, even if I had a sword of my own. Still, I've managed to live a happy and productive life despite my lack of sword fighting ability. Partly because I know it's unlikely that I'll ever be attacked by a sword-wielding assailant, but also because I have video games for that sort of thing. I mean, forget about just swords. In video games, I'm deadly with a whole bunch of different weapons. Not only that, but I can cast magic spells, I can kill huge, dangerous-looking monsters, and I'm friends with all the coolest people around. It's like real life, but with all the irritating snags and sharp edges rounded down into a smooth, comfortable ride. In fact, that's a good way to describe a lot of my favorite games. Comfortable. Sure, there are challenges to be overcome, but if I make a mistake, I can always just reload a save. So if that's what I want, why is it that I keep being drawn to games that make me uncomfortable? Let me give you an example. This part will have early to mid-game Witcher 2 spoilers. Early on in the game, you'll be falsely accused of killing a king. You spend your time trying to clear your name and unravel an elaborate web of intrigue in the process. You do so with the help of your choice of two people, Yorveth or Roche. Yorveth is a badass-looking elf dude with an eye patch. He's a Scoia'tael, a rebel, and the wily and dangerous commander of a group of crack guerrilla fighters. In keeping with my policy of being friends with all the coolest people, I definitely want to be friends with Yorveth. But there's a fly in the ointment. You see, Yorveth is kind of a murderer. He's killed people, and not just soldiers either. Civilians, too. If Dandelion's account is to be believed, he's burned down at least one entire village. This is not a Robin Hood and Sherwood Forest situation here. This is an angry, hateful person. This is someone who's spent a lifetime stewing in resentment until he's cooked clear through. If you don't mind a bit of anachronism, you could even call him a terrorist. So maybe we'll go with Roche instead. Vernon Roche commands the Blue Stripes, a special unit of soldiers who mostly spend their time hunting down people like Yorvith. He's likable enough, sort of a tough, no-nonsense cop type. But he also works for King Foltest, to whom he shows unquestioning loyalty and for whom he's more than willing to get his hands dirty. In the prologue, Foltest tells him to torture a priest, and Roche doesn't even blink. He even threatens to beat Geralt if Geralt won't help him. This is not actually a nice person. If Yorveth is a terrorist, then you could probably call Roche his state actor counterpart, the secret police thug. Not a great choice between these two, is it? Yet these are the people who can help you, and you do need their help. Note that the game didn't have to be this way. It never had to be explicit about Yorveth's past and the burned villages. It never had to have Roche tell us how much practice he's had beating prisoners. It could have had a pair of anti-hero types whose moral ambiguity comes by way of implication, swaddled in a comforting lack of specifics. They're not without their redeeming characteristics, after all. They're both clever, brave, tenacious, principled in their own way, and loyal to their friends. So why put these discordant elements in there at all? Why not have a pair of companions that is easier to like, without all the troubling moral baggage? I have an unusual way of answering that question, centered around a seemingly unrelated concept. Historicity. This is a word often used in an academic context, but I'm going to use it in the way it's sometimes used when discussing historical fiction. In historical fiction, historicity can describe how evocative a work is in its use of period-accurate details and characterization, how authentic it feels. And when it comes to characterization in particular, this can lead to some tricky situations. Characters that are meant to be likable start doing unlikable things. Some writers may see this as a problem. But the braver, and in my opinion, better sort, see it as an opportunity, something to be mined for character development. A chance to explore both the characters and the setting they inhabit. And, weirdly enough, I've noticed that it's possible to use this dynamic in a fictional setting as well a sort of pretend historicity. What if you made a character that was a lifelong rebel, and you built that character through an understanding of the atrocities rebellions often bring with them in real life? And then you put that character in a story, not as a convenient and familiar archetype, but as a natural extension of the setting. Then, congratulations, you have achieved pretend historicity, and a richer canvas than you would have had otherwise. In the case of Yorveth, the character himself has come to dislike what he's become. 
When a rebellion with a popular and charismatic leader starts in the valley he lives in, he sees an opportunity to possibly rewrite his own section in the history books. Talk to him once he's joined, and he seems regretful, vulnerable, human. Well, elvish, but you know what I mean. This new take on the character doesn't contradict the old one. It strengthens it, makes it deeper. We learn that Yorveth has become thoroughly infatuated with the rebellion's leader, Saskia. An infatuation made all the more poignant by what she represents. She doesn't have his dark past. She's what it's too late for him to ever be. This story could never have been told if Yorveth had been a more comfortable character, if he had been a vaguely defined anti-hero, guilty of unspecified, easily ignored bad things. It only works if he's truly troubling, if there's real tension to play with. So, bravo CD Projekt, you did it right. Now let's take a look at what it looks like when you do it wrong. And, in the process, watch me be fashionably late to yet another party. You can add me to the long list of people disappointed by watchdogs. And at the root of that disappointment is its failure to take advantage of this dynamic. Aiden Pierce certainly does troubling things. He puts friends and family members in danger, spies on people, kidnaps them, treats pretty much everyone like dirt. And yet, the game continues to treat him as an at least somewhat justified protagonist. It's as though they want the artistic cachet of moral ambiguity without having the nerve to follow through on its implications. Think of the potential of a storyline where invasion of privacy is woven into an open-world power fantasy. A storyline that doesn't flinch at the player's own complicity in that invasion of privacy. Instead, we get a relatively by-the-numbers revenge plot that only grazes the surface of these issues and then moves on. Nothing is more frustrating than watching a game walk right up to the edge of doing something interesting and then change its mind. But that's what you get when you have a low tolerance for discomfort, when you shy away from challenging the player. Remember, when you hit the uncomfortable part, don't hurry past it. Stop and explore. I'm gonna throw one more example at you. This will be the last one, I promise, and it'll have pretty mild spoilers for the character of the Iron Bull in Dragon Age Inquisition. It'll also use some lingo that you may need to be familiar with the game world to understand. This big fella is a useful example of what I'm talking about because of the contrast between what he is and what he could have been. He's a Canari spy, which is to say he's still loyal to them, even though he doesn't seem like the type. The Kunari are generally dour, authoritarian, religious types, while the Iron Bull is laid-back, friendly, and distinctly non-judgmental. This creates tension between what the player expects and what the character actually is. It's a tension they didn't need to have. The writers could just as easily have made the Iron Bull a Talvashoth or a Vashoth, that is, a Kunari who either left the Kun or was never part of it to begin with. In fact, do that and the character practically writes himself. You just make him a free-living libertine type, the Isabella with horns that I and many others expected when we first encountered him in previews and promotional materials and such. But they didn't do that. Instead, they found a source of tension and examined it. Other characters challenge him on his affiliation with the totalitarian expansionist Kuhn. He himself has to attempt to reconcile his loyalty to the religion of his birth with his now broader life experience. This contrast doesn't weaken the character. It strengthens him, and it makes him an avenue to more deeply explore the setting. Remember, when you hit the uncomfortable part, don't hurry past it. Stop and explore. I know that this advice is broad and tricky to understand, and believe me, it's even trickier to explain. But I'm giving it anyway because I consider it important. To the extent that there's an alchemical process by which entertainment can be transmuted into art, this concept is a crucial part of it. It's very often the difference between a rote exercise in adhering to a genre and a literary exercise in expanding it. So remember, when you hit the uncomfortable part, don't hurry past it. Stop and explore. So, now we're done with that. If you're still here, thanks for sticking around. Next up, the subject you've all been waiting for. At long last, I finally, once and for all, settle my long-running, very ugly, and very public feud with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Stay tuned!